Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm Lindy Elkins Tanton. I'm the principal investigator of the NASA Psyche mission, and I'm managing director and co chair of ASU's Interplanetary Initiative. So, welcome to another social distancing uh, social from Future Tense in partnership with Slate, New America, and Arizona State University. Today, we're talking about an amazing idea space exploration in the age of social distancing. And I'm joined by Ellen Stofan, my very good friend and the director of the National Air and Space Museum. Hi, Ellen, how are you today? I am great. It's uh, great to see you, even if, even if we're on opposite sides of the country. <laughs> I'm really glad to be able to chat, even if it's from a distance. Uh, we had um, talked ahead of the time about some big ideas that we might wanna go over here. And I thought the one we should maybe start with is the importance of really bold inspirational activities even and maybe especially now. And I think you have some amazing things to say about that theme of why space exploration during the age of COVID. You know, two of the things I've really been reflecting on over the last 10 weeks that I've been pretty much just sitting right here in this chair um, <laughs> is, is that whole idea of what the space program has done for this country um, not in terms of the stuff you and I care about, understanding how planets form and how they change over time, but really that inspiration piece. And when you consider last summer, we spent an awful lot of time celebrating the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon. And to me, as we went through that last summer, really reflecting on the fact that when John F. Kennedy called uh, to land humans on the moon at that Rice University speech, Eight and a half years later, we landed on the moon and safely returned those three astronauts back to the earth. At that time, he made that call. Lindy, it's astonishing to reflect on what, how little we had. We had never really kept anybody alive in space before. We didn't, you know, so our knowledge of life support systems, our knowledge of how to do trajectories, let alone planetary returns, I mean, what we didn't know was staggering. And yet in eight and a half years, we did it. We need that kind of moonshot thinking, and, you know, to overcome things like a pandemic. But we also need, I think, especially the people in this country to reflect on the fact, look what we're capable of when we put our mind to it. It's, it's so easy to be discouraged right now. And yet think of Apollo, Think of those eight and a half years. Look what we overcame to make the possible possible. That is so well said, and I agree with you entirely. And it, it, I, it, what you started, you know, you said at one point not the things you and I care about, the how do planets form. And I love the science. I really do love the science, and I know you love the science too. But I think it's true for both of us that it's not fundamentally the reason that we do what we do. I, I, I talk about this with the Psyche team. I think the real purpose of space exploration is to remind all of us here on Earth of the miracles that we can create when we work together. And you think about something as complicated as what people figured out to do during Apollo, or I just think about Psyche trying to send this robotic orbiter out to this asteroid way past Mars to know that we can get it to the asteroid and put it into orbit around the asteroid with this team of right now 800 people. And it's a project that's way too complicated for any single person to understand. And that is a leap in human evolutionary ability when we can do projects that are too complicated for any single person to understand and yet they work the way space exploration projects work. If we can do that, we can solve our problems here on earth. And so I, I think we can't help exploring and the fact that we can't help exploring gives us this way to inspire ourselves to do better here, especially now. Yeah, I mean, two weeks ago we had, I think it was two weeks ago, we had um, Jim Lovell came and did an Air and Space Live um, with, the, with the Smithsonian. And obviously the guy is the most charming, great storyteller on earth. And to hear him talking about Apollo 13, again, just the 50th anniversary of that this past month. Um, and apparently no one actually did say at the time, um, failure is not an option, but obviously it's a term that Gene Kranz has certainly um, made made popular, but failure wasn't an option, right? They didn't look at it that way. They said, we're not gonna lose these astronauts. This catastrophe has happened, but we're gonna bring those astronauts back safely. And they, they did it. And, and again, we, we need that kind of Apollo 13 moonshot thinking. And, and I think if people remember that, and like you say, 
It is what drives most of us to participate in the space program. We love the science, but, but it's the inspiration um, that really keeps us there. I think that's right. And that, and that inspiration can work for everyone, not just for the thousands and thousands of people actually work on space exploration, but for everyone else. In fact, in a way, it's sort of the ultimate inspiration. It's a sort of a vehicle that brings students into education, that convinces people to try something new in their lives, that pushes us past. And if there's ever a time in the world that we need that, I think that it's now. Uh, this idea that each person could internalize that they themselves can make a difference, they themselves can figure it out. Um, and the power of having that kind of purpose and project in your life, I, I, it, on Psyche Mission, uh, we just did our project critical design review last week, uh, Monday through Friday, every day. And it was the 18th critical design review in what I was calling festive critical design review season. <laughs> And uh, it is, I, I would say, probably the biggest and most important review in the entire lifetime of a mission. And, uh, and Thomas Zerbuchen, Associate Administrator at NASA, um, messaged me right after I gave my opening remarks. He said, um, I think CDR is um, the number one indicator for how a mission is going to go overall. He said, have fun, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> So there we all were doing for the very first time doing this virtually. Uh, NASA has never done this virtually before. Everybody presenting all day for four straight days and then the closed board review at the end. And what I saw in the people there was that the, the project and the purpose was carrying them through the fear and the trauma of what we're going through as a nation and as a world. And so I feel that uh, there are places for everyone who wants to, to feel connected to the projects that we're doing and feel that inspiration for the future, which maybe many of us need right now. I hope so. And I hope people um, watch the launch next week with that in mind. Um, you know, a lot of us are very focused on the fact that we're gonna launch um, US astronauts from US soil for the first time um, since the last shuttle mission. Um, up to the International Space Station on the okay. SpaceX rocket. Um, and, and to me, it's this incredibly exciting milestone that again, really shows this is our space program. We're gonna move it forward. We really are gonna get people back to the moon and on to Mars. And, and I, I think next week's an incredibly exciting event. And I, I hope people can find inspiration in it. I really hope so too. And I can hardly believe that it's happening at this moment when we need the inspiration most. Is there more that you can tell us about those astronauts? And I'm, I'm thinking also of the questions that we got um, before this event uh, via Twitter, people asking about, are the astronauts social distancing? How are new astronauts going up to the space station uh, uh, you know, kept so that they, there's no chance of infection? Can you talk about all those things that they must be working on right now? Well, it's funny because quarantine has been part of the space program for astronauts since they're, you know, <laughs> quarantine is something they know a lot about. I mean, <laughs> we actually have at the Air and Space Museum, the Airstream trailer that was specially adapted for the Apollo 11 crew when they came back from the moon, because at that point, we didn't know as much about planetary protection as we do now. And at that point, the moon, people hadn't ruled out the moon as a potential biological it, that it could host biological organisms. Mm. And so the astronauts were quarantined when they, they came back uh, from the moon and we, they quarantined the first few crews and then stopped doing it. We obviously don't do it anymore. But astronauts are always quarantined before they go up to the International Space Station. That's long, um, long policy because you don't want one astronaut with the flu or cold. Mm or anything going up there and in the confined space of the, of the space station, then getting all the rest of the astronauts sick and what if they were complications. So in this case, COVID isn't really a new circumstance for them. They wanna make sure that nothing, no germs get up to the ISS that don't belong there. And they have a pretty rigorous cleaning of the ISS itself because it obviously is an environment that's like sitting there. It's kind of warm. It's, you know, got a little bit of humidity and a lot of people in there exercising and stuff. Yes. So they have pretty rigorous cleaning and sampling of it. But because the astronauts are quarantined together and because we're pretty confident they're healthy when they go up to the International Space Station, they don't have to do social distancing 
once they're up there with the other astronauts. But there are certainly, certainly those astronauts that are launching uh, next week are already in quarantine. That's amazing. And it sounds like we might have actually learned things about how to quarantine people from the space program. Just, is that true that you know of? Well, I think it's again, yeah, because it's a, it's a long-term thing. I mean, it's been going on since the 1960s. We've been quarantining astronauts. And, and a lot of it really is this incredible monitoring of astronaut health. And certainly what we've learned uh, about telemedicine um, that has been routine on the ISS for the last 16 years. So almost 20 years, it's in fact, this year we're celebrating the 20th year of astronauts up on the International Space Station. So while they've been up there, you know, we've had astronauts, normally they go up for six months. Sometimes they're up there in the case of Scott Kelly for a year or nearly a year with Peggy Whitson. And so they've, we've been practicing telemedicine. They've learned things about telemedicine that are now being implemented they were around the world before COVID, but certainly now with this current pandemic, um, many of us have gotten more used to telemedicine. And that to me is one of the amazing things about the technologies that come out of, this, of the space station are things that people don't even realize are already part of their everyday lives. And uh, we've been learning an awful lot about human health on the ISS um, because we've really learned about how the human body changes when it gets into microgravity, um, your immune system actually does lose some function. Right. Um, that being said, we've not had astronauts become ill. Um, your bone density, uh, your bones uh, lose density, your muscles start to atrophy. So the astronauts have to exercise for about an hour and a half every day on the space station. My favorite thing is what we've really learned is that to keep the astronauts healthy, they need to eat right, not eat too much salt and exercise every day. Now, does that sound something <laughs> familiar <laughs> that all of us should be doing? Um, so yes. that's astronaut lifestyle. And, and I think another part of that, which is really important is all the work that people have done on how large a group do you need socially to remain our human healthy social selves. And that is particularly important right now where we're going through this process that is called social distancing. But I think that that's really a misnomer because it's physical distancing. Socially, we can still be deeply connected. You know, seeing you here makes me happy. I've missed you. It's nice to see you. And now I feel this warmth of friendship. And so, uh, uh, you know, having that group of people that you are socially connected to is also critical. And I know a lot of experiments have been done on that, haven't they been? There's been a lot done with the astronauts because they are in isolation, but actually um, uh, the, the doctors have really been able to pull on a huge body of research about humans in isolation, whether it's um, humans who've had to um, spend time in submarines, uh, people who overwintered in Antarctica in, in small groups on bases down in Antarctica. So human behavior um, in isolation is, has been pretty well studied over the years and certainly the astronauts are part of that. So astronaut mental health, there's actually been books written on it yeah. because that's an important aspect. Um, as we all know, when you're not feeling particularly happy or particularly um, energetic, it really does affect how you work, how you think, how productive you are. And it turns out the more people do not interact you almost become dopey. You know, your, your reaction oh. time slows, your oh. mental processing slows. And why we really think about this a lot is um, we're up there with astronauts on the International Space Station, not as the end game. The end game is we want humans on Mars doing field work. We want humans on the moon. We want, um, I've been addicted to the expanse for the last 10 <laughs> weeks. We want humans across this solar system and beyond. And so we exactly. have to really understand what are those effects of space on the human body and what are the effects of long duration space travel. And right now it's about seven to eight months to get humans to Mars. They're gonna be there for probably some amount of time. You're talking about a three year mission. How do we keep yeah. the astronauts, not just healthy with their body, but healthy mentally. And, and part of that is stimulation, exercising, talking to family, um, having time on their own own to do what they want to do, um, yes, yeah. music, so watching movies, interacting socially with each other. Yeah. Those are all things they've found to be really important. Just like they are for us here on home, at home. And this is a lot of the inspiration for the Interplanetary Initiative at, at ASU, as you know, this idea that 
to become an interplanetary species with all of the discoveries and the wonder and the inspiration to do better that that will bring to us. We need all different disciplines to take part in this. It's not just the scientists and the engineers, but obviously we need sociologists and psychologists and we need people who are experts in, frankly, entertainment <laughs> and the cognitive science of that and, and, and food and all the different things that make us human have to be part of this process. And so well, indeed. Maybe we all the more reason to be doing this now. Yeah, and one of the things that I know you're gonna be, you will care about as much as I do is one of the things they've certainly found with a lot of the kind of group experimentation that we've done for preparing humans for long duration space flight, diverse teams do better. Um, you know, having both men and women, having people from different backgrounds, having a mixed group means mm -hmm. you have a better performing, happier group. And that's not a surprise to those of us who are really committed um, to, to the importance of diversity and, and how we need to make sure we're including everybody in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Um, but it's something we know about from doing research on, on getting teams ready to go to Mars. I love that. I absolutely love that. And, and that is something that I'm passionate about and that we've talked about a lot of times, how do you create diverse teams here on earth because that makes such a difference to everyone who's involved. No, I love that. That's great. Um, one thing I think we should talk about a little bit, I think that we've covered in my mind all of the compelling reasons why humans need to do this. And, uh, and, and also foremost among those, the fact that we can't resist, that there are always people among us who have to do it. We're gonna try, it doesn't matter, we're gonna do it. Um, we do have challenges right in this moment in continuing doing what we're doing. Um, and I feel like that's something worth talking about. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you just to begin with, about the ways that people can interact with the museum right now when we can't go there in person? Well, it's it's been an interesting time for us because um, the Air and Space Museum is usually vying with the Louvre for the most, most one of the most visited museums in the world. We, we have, we welcome somewhere between five and eight million people through our door every year. So those in-person visitors are really important to us. But frankly, even a couple of years ago, we started really thinking, how do we become not just a national museum? How do we become a global museum? And this is something the Smithsonian, which has 19 museums and research units, has really been thinking about writ large. So we've started working on it, thinking what's our digital strategy? What's our, our online education strategy? And then of course, COVID hits. And all of a sudden that's not just a we need to get to that. We need to do that in the fuzzy future. Oh my God, we need to have done it yesterday. Teachers around the country need yeah. us. Families around the country need us. So the Smithsonian with the Air and Space Museum being part of this has done a huge pivot. So if you go to our website right now, the first thing you see when you land on our website is K to 12 teacher resources mm -hmm. and what we call air and space at, um, everywhere. What can you do? You can take a virtual tour of the museum. You can listen to Jim Lovell talking about, about Apollo 13. So you can really experience our content. And right now, frankly, I've got a lot of my team working on how do we make this even better? How do we expand it even more? Because, and frankly, museums around the world are doing this and it's really important because museums are, are living places that help the public understand the present in the context of the past, but then really help to envision a better future. And, and so what better time than now, again, to look to a place like the Air and Space Museum and say, look what we've overcome in the past. We've defied gravity. Um, we can <laughs> defy a virus also. Yes. Oh, my goodness. I also feel like in a weird way, this is a great opportunity for education. And we've been stuck for a long time in this passive kind of education where, where in its end uh, manifestation, there's someone at the front giving a lecture and you are listening passively, memorizing things and then putting them back on an exam. And, and I would argue that very few of those skills are actually useful for work and life. The things that in fact, you're being trained. There's, um, there is an, uh, a phenomenon studied by um, psychologists called, called um, learned helplessness. And I think that phrase kind of says it all. Like you learn to be helpless in learning. You learn that only the other person has the answer. You learn that everything's already been discovered. You learn that the only way to make progress is to memorize. Um, 
And it turns out that when you take people out of the classroom and have them learning online, then they have all the online resources because now we're in a world where all the content is available to us all the time. And so in the classroom, you can pretend that the student has to solve the addition problem without their calculator or pretend that they need to know who did a certain thing without being able to look it up online. But when everyone is online all the time, it teaches us that we have to learn those other more important transferable skills, like how do you work together in a team to come up with a more complex answer to something? Or how do you ask the right question? And so we have this amazing opportunity and it is happening. I see it happening with some of the public high schools in Arizona that we work with, where they're learning to teach differently, teach for the future. And so I'm hoping that like the revolution that you're going through, bringing your museum into a much more accessible and different space, that I think it's happening in education too. I don't think that this is terrible. I think that this is a way for us to be better, to give us a way to pivot. Um, you, know, you know, I think a lot of people might agree with me with this idea that STEM education actually has not been ideal. It's been exclusionary, it's been non-diverse, it doesn't always hold creativity. Uh, and so it's not that we want to return to doing what we used to do, it's time for us to figure out how to do it better and now we have this chance to try. Yeah, and we've been thinking about that exactly a lot when you think about, um, for example, right now our virtual museum tours are um, literally you're walking through the museum. And yet we have this amazing collection, a lot of which is in storage. Some of it is archival materials, archival video, diaries. And if you didn't approach it as we're starting with the physical and going to the virtual, if you start with the virtual and reimagine, yeah. just think what you can do. And, and so to me, it's this incredibly exciting time. And, and I know, you know, obviously neither one of us want to um, make light of, of how horrible this pandemic has been yeah. and how harmful it's been, especially in certain communities around this country. But you have to say we're in this incredible lemon of a situation and how do we make lemonade out of it? How do we, how do we become better through this um, and really learn from it? Exactly, exactly. No, not to minimize in any way the unbelievable trauma that people are going through. And, and also, as you point out, the, um, the disproportionate way that that trauma is falling upon certain groups. Surely we could do better. And, yeah. and, so, and so let us not give up. Let us strive more compellingly toward that. I want to encourage everybody to put in questions if you have them, because we'll be very happy to um, take questions uh, uh, from people online. And um, the, the questions that we, that we collected ahead of time on Twitter, just a few of them mainly about uh, social distancing with astronauts and how they take care of new astronauts arriving that were, that were answered. And I, I wondered, um, one question that, you had, that we had ahead of time that you touched on but didn't quite completely go through was um, this question of, someone asked, I'm just going to read it out because it's so clear the way it was written in Twitter. If someone coughs or sneezes on the International Space Station, wouldn't droplets just hang around until they collided with some surface stopping momentum? How do you keep the entire station sanitized? Um, can you say more about that? That's exactly what would happen because obviously the, the um, for, first of all, um, also realize that in space, you can really play with Newton's laws. And I would love to see a great video of this because when you sneeze on earth, we're pretty grounded when we sneeze and you're propelling something forward, but you don't move backward in space. If you sneeze, you would actually move backward because <laughs> of force, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? We all learned that from Newton. So first of all, that's kind of funny to think about unless they were hanging on. I would think you'd have to hang on before you sneezed, but. Oh my goodness, sneezing um, protocol. Yes, <laughs> but obviously yes, any droplets would remain in the air. And so for example, um, I've never heard of anyone doing this for a cough and a sneeze, but when the astronauts wash their hair, um, they, they put little bits of water on their head and wash their hair and they're having to hose up any little droplet of water because of course, um, over 80% of the water on the International Space Station is recycled so that it can be used again. Um, think of the ISS as how we should live sustainably everywhere. Um, right. So they preserve every drop of water. And so I would imagine if you had all these droplets hanging around, one could vacuum them up with their little suction device they use for water. I but they that. don't worry about keeping the ISS clean. As I said, they 
they do have to clean it um, frequently. Um, and they wanna make sure that if, um, the interesting thing they have found is through experiments, um, bacteria actually, are, and viruses don't behave the same way they do on earth because again, everything here on the earth has evolved in one G of gravity. And it turns out that has affected, like with our immune systems becoming um, less effective in space, you don't really, it's hard to predict sometimes what the lack of gravity does to an organism. And it turns out that it sort of turns different genes on and right. off. Right. So some bacteria actually become more virulent in space, some become less virulent. And so they're trying to use this information. For example, there's a lot of research done up on the ISS on the potential for new vaccine development. Oh. Because as you figure more out, um, Lindy, we know as scientists, when you figure more out, it tends to open up even more questions that you hadn't Just even thought questions. to ask before. Yes. And so they've learned so much on the ISS, but there's still a lot of microgravity research to be done. It's an incredibly rich facility. I, I love what you just said. And to me, that is the, the central thing that I want people to learn when we're learning together. And that is that it's all questions. There are almost no answers out there. You, you, you grow up surrounded with textbooks. You think everything's been discovered. Where's the place for me in that world of discovery? It's all done. Well, it turns out all of our information is changing all the time. And every time we make a new discovery, it's just a sea of new questions. And there's so much to still learn. We've gotten a couple of great questions, and um, this first one brings us around to new space. Uh, it seems we're finally entering a phase of space exploration and travel in which private companies are finding success. Uh, do either of us think that considering problems with government funding and shutdowns and juggling priori priorities, will there be a moment in which private companies overtake the government in space? And uh, I think that's such an apt thing to talk about with the crude uh, launch that's about to happen. Yeah, and, and I, I, I always find this because I, I get this question a lot from the public and I always find it to be a really interesting perspective that frankly is very different from the way that I come at it. Me because too. people really look at it as a competition like, oh, yeah. SpaceX and, and your Boeings and, and Blue Origin, they're like against the government. And it's an and, it, it's, it's not an or. And, and so to me, when I see SpaceX, you know, getting ready to launch astronauts up to the ISS and, and Boeing, ho hopefully following next year, mm -hmm. when you see Blue Origins and Virgin Galactic, you know, moving towards taking tourists up into space, that's an and. And the more they work on that transport piece, to me, it allows NASA to focus on the exploration piece. Yes. Um, because if you think about when the railroads started in, in the United States, you know, it was the railroads were first the government, you know, that was who was doing it. And as soon as it became profitable and there was a profit motive, the government stepped away. And so to me, something like taking astronauts back and forth to the International Space Station, that's, I, I don't want to call it routine. Anytime you're messing with space, it is not routine. But that's something that NASA can now turn over to the private sector right. and just buy as a service, just like they buy you know, widgets from a company. But when it comes to sending humans to Mars or figuring out the next great observatory that's gonna help us understand the origins of the universe or really figuring out how do we develop even more advanced sensors to help us understand Earth's climate, those are things that only the government can do, right. only NASA can do. And so I like to say, the more the private sector steps up, the more NASA can step forward. That is so well put. I mean, the history of science in exploration has always been one of tagging along. You think about Darwin on the Beagle and he was just put on board to keep the captain company. He wasn't put on board because it was a scientific exploration. It was absolutely a commercial exploration. And then he used his brain and discovered things along the way, but it wasn't about science. To really make those expensive fundamental discoveries about science, it takes a government doing it on behalf of the people. And then when you have those things that can be monetized, the market parts, and this is something that uh, Chris Lewicki and I have been talking about a lot. What is the deep space space economy? You know, what is the sustainable market uh, for something that's not in, in Earth orbit? And those are really great questions. It has to be, and also because. Well, you think about, I think Star Trek showed it to us first in our generation, how we can be our better selves. 
we can do this as an and. It doesn't have to be bimodal. It doesn't have to be the US versus the Soviet Union or the US versus China. It can be us as humanity doing things together in an idealized state. And so let's see if we can creep toward that and instead of or. You know, I, I did another fun event with the Future Tense folks on um, science fiction. And um, we, our museum, people might say, what do you have science fiction in your museum for? But right when you would come in before we started the renovation, when you came into Air and Space, there was the model that was used in the filming of Star Trek, the Starship <laughs> Enterprise right in our front doorway. And science fiction to me is a really interesting way in which we create the future because I was listening to an NPR show and I don't know who said it, but they said no one ever invented something that someone didn't imagine first. Right. And, and so science fiction to me, it's how we imagine, right? So we're imagining that deep space economy in countless TV shows, science fiction books, you know, that's been explored. And so to me, we're now working on how do we actually make that a reality? Suddenly oh. it seems touchable just the way, you know, to me at some point, a cell phone was not something, you know, that was a communicator on Star Trek. It wasn't something I would all of a sudden find indispensable in, <laughs> in my life. And science fiction helps us imagine the future and then we create it. Right. Right, and to talk about something I learned just a few years ago, how fundamental the idea of space exploration is to the human psyche that uh, uh, the Greeks, so we're talking, you know, two millennia ago, people had begun to imagine being off of the earth, out into space, looking back at the earth and seeing it as a sphere against space and seeing all of the earth in its, in its entirety from a vantage point that was well off of the earth. And this was before there was even the imagining that there could ever be the technology to allow us to do that. We were already driving toward being in space. Uh, and I feel like this other, another question that we got is kind of perfect for you as a follow-up to this. The question is, how should we better promote the goals and ideals of our space program and NASA's work among the public? Are we, both the public and the media and the press, doing enough to talk about space exploration and what it can do to change our understanding of our world and the benefits the research can bring. You know, that's something that is really, um, you know, it's frankly, it's why I'm at the Air and Space Museum because, because to me, the next step in my career was how do we take these amazing things that we do in exploration and aviation and get the public as excited about it and as inspired by it because um, you know, we started out with this talking about the inspiration of Apollo and, and Apollo inspired an entire generation of STEM people. Some of them became astronauts, friends of mine who were inspired by Apollo. Some of them um, became some of us planetary scientists, but a lot of them became the doctors, the mechanical engineers, the civil engineers, the architects that helped move this country forward a guy like Jeff Bezos, why is, is he the tech guy that he is today? He was inspired by Apollo. So I that know. inspiration piece, um, I, I think is something that we can just never, never stop overlooking. And so then the question becomes, how do we do a better job of, of communicating this? And I always feel like there's the nerd public of which I'm firmly a member. <laughs> And I'm totally paying attention to what Psyche is doing and I'm totally <laughs> excited about it. And I'm, I'm waiting for that launch next Thursday, you know, Wednesday, oh. Thursday, um, next week. But there's a lot of the public who's not paying attention. And those are the people I wanna grab hold of. Those are the people that I do wanna engage. And frankly, I thought we saw it happen. For example, when Scott Kelly was up on the International Space Station for a year, you know, he was on the cover of Time. He was on the nightly news. And so we broke out of, we broke out of just talking to ourselves and enlarged yes. who we talk to. And yes. so to me, why did that break through? People were excited about the idea of why. We were going to Mars. We were doing something new. We were doing something innovative. We were getting ready. We were doing something we'd never done before. And, and so part of it is to, I think, really frame better how we talk about what we do. And I will say, you've done a fantastic job of this with Psyche. You have to make it relevant. You have to have the so what, the why. Yeah. And I feel like we can always be improving how we do that. 
Yeah, I agree with you completely, as you know that I do, because I do talk about this all the time. And it kind of connects with some questions we're getting about um, uh, why would we prioritize space exploration at a time like this? And, and also, what can we bring out of this COVID pandemic that will help us do more space science and engineering in the future? And, and to me, the, the very most fundamental answer is uh, by aspiring to be more than what we are, that is what makes us human. And if we were to stop, if we were to lose our exploration spirit, the idea that we could do something bigger, that sense of inspiration, it would be like losing civilization. I, I don't think these things are, are optional. It would, be, it would be another version of life without Mozart. How, how can we go forward without our souls, I think? I think we yeah. need this in a sense more than ever. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's that inspiration piece. It's the knowledge piece. But, but frankly, there, there is an economic piece. I mean, when you invest in doing something really hard, you return that money in spades to the U.S. economy. So I, I always laughed at one point there was a, a cartoon that showed like NASA launching a rocket with dollars going behind it. You know, we don't actually spend the money in space. We spend oh, no. here on the ground. I would say that every dollar spent here on Earth with humans. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so to me, it's an investment in the future. It, it's an investment in STEM jobs. It's an investment in inspiring kids. Um, and I think it's the now more than ever that we talked about. Mm hmm yeah, I think actually now more than ever, I, I agree with that. And uh, if there's ever a time that we need to be inspired beyond ourselves, it's certainly now. Um, we have a question here about um, the resources that are available for educators to incorporate, especially our ideas about new pedagogies and the way we might be thinking. And you talked about your museum website and um, anyone who's interested in learning more about what we've, we've been doing, feel free to email me. My email me is, is out on the internet <laughs> I'm at Arizona State University. I'm easy to reach. But, but Ellen, what other resources and what other ways to share not just the pedagogy, but the ideas um, and the topics that we're talking about? I, I think there's a lot of resources out there and I would really urge people to go to a, a site we have at the Smithsonian called the Learning Lab. So if you just Google Learning Lab, you'll go to it and it doesn't pull just resources from air and space, but from all across Beautiful. Um, the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian is really unique um, in this country. We don't have a ministry of culture, um, but, but we have the Smithsonian, which covers the arts, the sciences, exploration, um, and to me, more than anything, inspiration. And obviously, it also talks about the story of all of the people of this country and their incredible experiences. And, and so I would really urge people to go to Learning Lab because you'll find things that you didn't even know you didn't know. And I think that that's beautifully connected also to, uh, and you should correct me on this, but my understanding of the origins of the Smithsonian where, where Mr. Smithson had money at the ready and it was really the return of the exploration expedition. It was sort of America's answer to the Beagle, our giant expedition that went to uh, uh, the, the uh, Antarctica and way up to the Pacific Northwest and came home with ships full of discoveries. And didn't that become the Smithsonian? It was part of the original collection of the Smithsonian, but you know, when he died, he actually, um, he left his money to his nephew. Um, he had no children. He left his money to his nephew and said, well, if my nephew predeceases me or dies before, um, before me, he, um, the money should then go to, to starting uh, an institution for the purpose of the diffusion, creation and diffusion of knowledge in the United States. And there was a lot of confusion about why he did this. And I'm sorry, but luckily for us, um, poor Mr. Nephew did die. Um, and so the money didn't go to the nephew and instead came to the United States. Um, and frankly, and Congress didn't know what to do with this. They're kind of like, okay, what do we do with all this money? And they, while they were arguing about it, apparently they invested in the money in bonds, um, which, went, uh, which went belly up. Oh, I didn't and know that. The, the money disappeared actually. And Congress decided, um, you know what? This was actually a good idea and founded the Smithsonian. That's a great story. It's a great story. We have just a few more minutes. We're gonna sort of wrap up in about four minutes. Um, I wanted to answer a question someone has asked about how uh, working on Psyche Mission has changed with the pandemic. And then we have another question about um, how people can learn more about what our astronauts are doing on the ISS and what programs NASA is working on. And Ellen, what your favorite 
or uh, ongoing projects that you're most excited about. So let me answer about Psyche and then hand it to you to say where okay. people should go and what you're most excited about. I think it'd be a great place to end. So it's been uh, an amazing challenge for Psyche because we are in this really critical period where we're um, hopefully about to pass our CDR and get our decision from NASA to go to the final assembly test and launch and, and we're supposed to launch in two years. And so much can be done remotely, but of course you can't actually build hardware without building the hardware with your hands. Uh, and so uh, we've done incredibly well. All of our hardware builds are ongoing. Um, all of them at a lower level, a safe level with people distanced and huge amounts of um, careful uh, work to keep everyone safe. We have no one on the team who's sick. We're very, very lucky. And everyone has the option who would be working on hardware, whether they feel comfortable with what we're doing or not. And they can opt out with no detriment. So we think we're handling it really well. And at the moment, we are okay. We're still, you know, fingers crossed that, that we're able to move forward, at least at the pace we're going right now. Um, it's, it's happening. We started doing things like um, every couple of weeks having a, a, a WebEx video meeting for the entire team. And so we'll have 200 people or 300 people online in, you know, in the morning just for an hour to catch up with each other. Because I think in the end, the thing that makes all of this possible is the fact that it's a human endeavor. Everything we do is a human endeavor. It's about the people working together and it's about inviting everyone to the table to make their contribution and about caring about every person. And to me, that's the most important thing about the team and about the thing that we're doing. And, and so far we're, we're muddling forward. And so, um, you know, keep your fingers crossed for us. So Ellen, tell us more. I'm, I'm totally excited. Well, if people want to learn more about what's going on up on the International Space Station, please go to NASA's website where they have tons of pages that talk about the research that goes on on the ISS, all the technology development. Um, and I'd also go to another NASA page that I think is called NASA in Your Life that talks about all the spin-off technologies in your house, in your clothes, in your workplace, in the world around us that have come a lot of it from our push to get humans um, up up above the earth um, and then hopefully onto the moon and Mars. So please check that out. In our last, my last 30 seconds, the thing I'm the most excited about right now is another upcoming NASA mission. It's called Dragonfly, no investigator on the mission. It is a mission led by Elizabeth Turtle of the Applied Physics Lab of Johns Hopkins University. And it's going to send a quadcopter, so a little drone, well, it's not so little, um, to Saturn's moon Titan, which is my favorite place in the solar system. I am so excited about Dragonfly also, and uh, just uh, a shout out for diversity and inclusion. There are um, so far three women who have competed for and won major space missions. The first was Maria Zuber, and I was the second, and Elizabeth Turtle is the third and all of us are friends and colleagues, and I'm so rooting for Dragonfly because that is gonna be so cool. So um, I think that our time is up. And so first of all, thank you so much, Ellen. It was such a pleasure to share this with you. And thank to, thanks to everyone who joined us today. And there will be more future tense social distancing socials coming up. I think they happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so I think that's the end for today. So thank you all for coming and, uh, and goodbye and stay well. Thank you.